Okay. Um, I'd I'd add a I'd add just a point of if I was editing this, I'd add just a point of clarification that city city council and staff are definitely responsible for execution and that safe streets are mm -hmm. I would I would say a community priority because I don't think that's particularly in dispute. We all we all want safe streets and we all have to work toward that. Well, something about an empowerment of all of us to, because uh, I'm, I'm seeing that first paragraph with the, uh, the red uh, portion, responsible for ensuring, um, sorry, for people listening. Um, this is one tool the city has for bringing up safety concerns, but ultimately the city council and staff are responsible for ensuring that Kaiser City streets are safe for all users. Um, I think what I'm hearing is that this also will equip all um, residents to be involved. And uh, also in that first sentence, I would like to change citizen to resident. And any place that occurs in the document to make that change. I agree, I thought I caught all those, so thank you for bringing that up. If anyone sees any others that I overlooked, please tell me. We'll just uh, word search, yeah. find, replace. All right, let's go on then to um, section two, the NTM program. Uh, comments on that, on, on the packet, that's pages 31 and 32. And I had one small one, and that was on, um, on enforcement. It's the keeps mentioning speeding. This document, this program is more than speed. There are a number of things that people may be concerned about, safe passage, um, uh, multimodal um, interoperability, speed may not be the only thing. So um, I would like to take out speeding so community awareness of transportation problems can be increased, which is something I think is more general and that's what we are getting at. And there's a number of places in the document I have made note of that, so if we can broaden the, the lens here, I think we'll get at what we're after. Uh, Councilor Hussman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I'd like to echo that as well with the engineering section to be sure traffic calming is definitely a massive uh, point of engineering focus with respect to cars and engineering definitely means quite a bit to others who walk and roll. So I, I agree with the need to be a little bit more expansive there in that we want to be cognizant of the different ways in which people are moving around the neighborhoods. I would agree. So if we can. What do you recommend in the engineering? Um, traffic calming, um, but also, again, multimodal facility. So if there's a way to improve, so like we did over by Cummings Elementary, you put in that, um, that table that facilitates crossing the street as well as traffic calming for people in motor vehicles. Um, I use that all the time when I go for walks anymore. I love it. Yeah. It, um, Do you want it to still say to reduce speeding and or affect traffic volume or are we? Well, again, um, traffic calming or multimodal facility, maybe just period there. What do you think? Good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Councilor Husband. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And Tammy, I'll admit I don't necessarily have a good bullet pointed list for this, but Sim, I do think we would do better to acknowledge that there are many, many different outcomes from engineering. Being uh, Calmness is one of them. Uh, flow is another. Um, Try, trying to think of what other safety, frankly, is one. So brought more broadly than just calming, but there are many different safety initiatives. Um, in in some way, in some ways, it's just we we don't necessarily want to think of engineering as strict strictly gadgets or strictly obstacles, but also different different ways in which um, people are encouraged to move through the neighborhoods. I don't have better articulation than that. No, I, I think I captured what we're trying to gather, so that's okay. Thank you. Um, anything else on section two? All right, uh, section three, which is on pages um, 32 and following. So we have the, um, the process for moving through, you know, if somebody brings an issue, 
what we're looking at. Um, Mr. Lindsay, yes. Thank you. Sorry. I, I do have a question because, in, and I understand in the spirit of trying to have inclusive um, language that we've repla we replace um, residents with citizens. Oh, uh, in the process on page three of number one, when it says 75% of the residents on a specific street, that's actually a term of art that means people who live there. That's, no, I, we're taking out citizen and putting in resident. Oh, oh okay. Because in the, in the very first one, it had said citizen, and I want to swap that out for resident. Oh, okay. So we're trying to broaden it so it's not necessarily an elector. Yeah. But it correct. is the people who are here. Okay, so. A business owner, they can be a property owner, they can be a renter. They're here. Fair enough. Does that, that help? Yeah, no, I got messed up. I got turned. All right. Oh, all right. <laughs> We're good. So I'll, I'll speak to the process before okay. we go too far into this. Um, I met with um, Director Brown, and we discussed the, um, the online application and what to do. So the, some of the changes you see here is based on that idea. Um, so the actual website is going to be implemented by the city staff, as I mentioned earlier. So my plan was just to lay out the process. And the process I envision it is to go on to our website through whatever, wherever we place it. Um, and then through Google Docs of sorts, they, um, they fill out their information. That will lead to the next screen that asks some questions. So my vision is we will replace all of the flowcharts with this system that will guide them through that based on the answers to the questions. Um, and so a lot of what you see here reflects that idea, which is why so much is crossed out. That will get rid of the paper application that we all agree was not very user friendly. Um, and with that in mind, I also proposed, and I don't think all of all of city council received this communication because it was um, most recent with, with Director Brown and myself. Um, I see there being four ways a person can approach the process as far as um, scenarios they would fit in and, and where it would lead them. So a resident can come to the neighborhood association that they belong to where an advocate is assigned to apply through the city website to follow the process. That would, not, that would negate the need for the 75% petition that was also a point of concern through so many voices. The second scenario I see is a resident who does not have representation. Uh, they'll apply through the website, but because they don't have rep representation of other voices, they'll have to get the 75% petition. And I did not build that. That's something that will need to be built. And again, the website's flowchart can stop the process until it's submitted. And so it will not progress beyond that. Um, the third scenario I see is a resident goes directly to the traffic safety committee where we direct them to go to the neighborhood association um, and then follow one or two based on whether or not they have representation. We're basically, we're gonna redirect them, but at that point we are taking note of the concern as we normally do in our, in our meetings. And the fourth scenario is a resident goes directly to the website where the pathway leads them to including their neighborhood association or to the um, petition that's gonna be needed. So it's gonna direct to which way it needs to. And in the end, we'll either have voices through the neighborhood association or a petition signed before it even gets to city staff to review as a concern. Does that make sense? Yes. Council President Starr. Thank you, Madam Mayor. For those listening at home, um, can you walk through the petitioning process? As of right now, it's stated that if someone has a concern, they need to get 75% of fronting properties to agree and sign the petition um, therefore speaking on behalf of more than one person for that concern. How are you proposing that they do that? Because there's a concern about knocking on doors. This is where I do not have the authority to say how that looks. I, 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 re I removed it from the document since we discussed this previously. Yeah. But Public Works asked to make sure that we include that as um, a means of, of not only having one person start um, a process that uh, not, no one else needs or agrees with. So can we have a conversation about that then? Because if we have people telling us that they don't feel safe knocking on doors, why are we, help me understand staff, why we're asking for that to be put back in.
I'm looking at Mr. Brown and Mr. Griffin, so who wants to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to it, and then, then if somebody wants to add to it, they can. Uh, but there is not a, um, I don't know of a better way uh, or an alternative way uh, for collecting signatures. Oh, there were, I mean, you can knock doors, but you can also um, post signs and s direct them to a place. Um, so we can think about the different alternatives to get them to a place where they can sign on to a petition where it, without having to knock doors. But um, their petitioning is, is something that's required for a lot of state practices. I'm sorry, I didn't hear, what was that last part? Petitioning is a process that is required for a lot of state practices. Okay, so follow up. So, again, if we have people in our communities telling us that they do not feel safe knocking on doors because they don't know what's on the other side, I get that it's, quote, a state process, but if our own residents are telling us that they don't feel safe doing that, why do we keep forcing that by putting it in a document? I mean, I've, I heard it. I've heard it in past, from past neighbor. I mean, I'm seeing people in the audience nodding their heads yes to that. Response? Yeah, Mr. Brown. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, so, like I said, we could put in there some alternative methods of signage that would direct people to uh, go to a certain place to be able to, if they want to sign up on it. Um, information uh, racks, kind of like realtor, um, boxes so there's there's a number of alternatives that we could put out are there are we paying for that or are we expecting our residents to pay for that it's something we could consider we might keep uh purchase a couple of boxes and then uh lend them out to some residents uh for each you know if, if there's somebody comes to us and says hey i want to get some signatures so could i or one of these boxes. That's that's a possibility. I'm thinking. Councilor Reed. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. So what I have heard as we have uh, d done these discussions is that part of this this the other side of the coin is yes, the 75 percent um, partition is a pretty high bar, but the other flip side of that is we don't want one person making decisions for the entire area and that is why we have some kind of uh, you know, a, a petition pe petition pr um, process in, in place so if we have a petition process in place um, we can do it in different ways and we can certainly be, be open to some of those things particularly from our no neighborhood associations who have been successful in this but I think it's important to keep in mind the principle here that we are not wanting one person or even a couple of people to make decisions for the whole area, uh, for, for the whole um, affected property, the fronting properties. I'm gonna go Councillor Kohler and then Councillor Hausman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. There's a question in my mind, is that the people that live there are the people that own the properties? Because the, the section here didn't spell that out very good for me. Good question in terms of um, if it's a renter or a um, or a property owner. I'm looking at Mr. Lindsay. Um, I, I would say honestly that the the idea is somebody who lives there and is affected by it, so it's the person in the building. Um, I would assume we would give the same recognition and status if the owner also felt that way because they own the property and perhaps they live there for a time too. And at this point, we're not asking for a, um, a financial uh, outlay on the part of any of the properties. We're looking at um, an operations or some sort of, uh, you know, transportation issue within that that neighborhood. Well, and I, I, I guess I would ask for clarity on how much distance, because sometimes it'll say street, and some of our streets are so long, 75% of a whole street could be really onerous versus like a block 
or two blocks or, you know what I mean? So I think we could get specific about that too, which might be helpful. Um, if it was one block, that would probably be easier to talk to your neighbors than it would be to go along a whole darn street. So actually I'd like to, if at all, pump this to public works and here's why. You guys already do outreach for particular types of projects and could probably give us um, an idea of what level of outreach has been necessary for different types of projects. Would that be something, uh, maybe a chart or um, some guidelines or recommendations? Mm, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, if it's a project, we'll just do door-to-door -door outreach, you know, notify residents of what's going on. We'll put it on the website. When it comes to, to this, this program and getting it started, I understand how we pushed it through the Neighborhood Association, but when it comes to sole residents, the basis of most of the ones we've dealt with have been a speeding issue. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's a perceived speeding issue and it's not there. And, and the amount of staff time for PD to go out there and initiate the speed study, all that involved, that goes back to the petition and not just everyone that calls it says, hey, there's a speeding issue on sunset and then we do a, a speed study. I'm not answering how we get that position because I understand there's a problem and I understand going door to door is something that people don't want to do. But I, we have to come up with something that's in between to get there so we're not just getting tons of phone calls and we're just turning around and saying, okay, we'll go do a speed study because that's, that's not the answer. Right, so I, I think I'm trying to uh, start get a little bit further back in the process because the speed study is a little further down the, the line from this. Uh, we have um, residents A, B, and C say that we feel that there's a, a speeding issue on Street X, and they bring this here. And they, um, how far do we are we going to ask them to go in getting agreement from neighbors in bringing this uh, their concern forward? That's the question we're trying to get a, a little bit of a handle on. And then I'll go to, I've said Councillor Hussman and then Councillor Duran. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd actually like to tease out something that isn't in the document, Tammy, but may be helpful. What about city councilor endorsements of some of these projects? Because we're, we're at large representatives of the community, so theoretically we represent every neighborhood. Um, we're obviously in communication with staff and we'd at, at least have a bead on some of these traffic plans or we could get that information uh, maybe, maybe with a little less friction than the average resident would. How might we fit in and our endorsement of potential neighborhood traffic concerns? What do you think about that? I don't think that's a decision that is for me to make. I'm just documenting what we all agree to is the correct process to follow for the city. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not the person to answer that. So you as city councilors can decide what role you do play and how does city staff feel about that? Totally fair. Ma Madam Mayor, may I open that up to? Uh, can we put a pin in that one for right now? Um, Cause uh, let's finish working through this, this particular process, but um, I think very likely this is going to end up with um, going, still going to traffic safety bike ped, um, even with our participation in helping inform people how to, how to engage in the process. I think that's probably going to be our role is to um, assist people in um, when they come to us, hey, uh, counselor, I've got a concern about this. Great. Let me walk you through the process. And I think that is where we can really equip people personally. Sure. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Duran. So I was just thinking, maybe we maybe we put in that we follow something like the planning department does for their uh, communicating with neighbors on issues of planning, which is 200 feet or something like that from the proposed. Mm -hmm. So uh, it just seems follow a number that mm -hmm. we already use for other things for letting people know. So I like it. Something easy. So that might be something we can incorporate to, so we have parallel processes for um, outreach so it's consistent for people in the community and it's, and there's a rational nexus. It's not like we're not being consistent because it's, we're being consistent, we're being consistent because there's a rationality behind it. Ms. Aldvar? I like that when it comes to certain 
things. Um, but if we're talking about speeding on a road or a street, um, I live here in the middle. Do I only need 250 feet in each direction, or can I spot and several of us sign the petition all throughout? That's where I'm a little lost on what number. Is it 75% of what? There's just so much ambiguity to this that um, I don't even know how we would put it in here. <laughs> well, when you're talking about um, perhaps a, a, a <clears throat> section where there's a, um, a feeling of speed issues, I would think that part of it would be up to the complainant to say within this block or two block area, uh, we are exper experiencing this. And I think that the complainant also should be able to, in some circumstances, say it's between this area and get 75% of the people within that area. Then it would be up to traffic safety or staff to go, okay, this is maybe we need to go a little farther, but I think that would be an, um, an opportunity for conversation. I don't think we have to be cut and dried on that, but I think a guideline, but I think a complainant should have some, um, some leeway in helping define the parameters of the problem. Council President Starr. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so this is in more of just something for us to keep in mind, and it is in no way meant to be taken as um, an insult to any of us at the dais, but I think that we are right now a an example of how we make involvement in city government intimidating um, and equitable, um, because now if we're having trouble figuring out um, how many people and in what way we're gonna ask them to bring an issue forward, and we're, it's gonna become so convoluted because now we're talking about realtor boxes, we're talking about petitioning, we're making this so convoluted. Is, or is that, I'm gonna go back to, I think it was the earlier document, purposefully cumbersome, because I feel like that's what we're doing. Um, and I don't know, this just makes me not want to bring problems forward because we're just going to make it so difficult. Um, and we know the process, right? And we know the system. So I would challenge us to look at this from a lens of what is going to encourage public engagement, um, not how we're making things purposefully cumbersome. And I think that was the phraseology that was in the first document, if I remember right, because that was what we didn't want to do. And so I'm just cautioning us to take a step back and simplify this so that we aren't, in, we aren't creating an overly complicated document for people, which we know we have a reputation for doing as a government. So the 75% only applies if there's no neighborhood association representation. So as long as, I, I'm, it, it's still valid what you're saying, I'm not arguing that at all, um, but if it helps us um, narrow down our thoughts here, it's really only a certain part of, as of right now that does not have representation. Um, not that it helps us find an answer, but maybe it'll sit a little bit more comfortably knowing that we're not trying to find a solution for the whole city. Well, I'm I think that we also, I think it's important to bear in mind we're bringing forward a process that has not worked for decades and trying to create a framework in which we can not only engage, but also uh, reasonably track uh, citizen concerns. One of the things that people have been frustrated with as they come to traffic safety, we haven't had a clear process for being able to, at the level of the committee, be able to have the conversation. So, so it's been a little bit hit and miss. Have they contacted Public Works? Have they contacted this person, that person? By having a, a, a place where we can gather together and keep track of the concerns people are bringing forward, now we have an accountability. So talking these through and um, feeling how, how these steps feel like um, I think it's a really important conversation to have, what we're doing right now, recognizing that once we make this big leap of decades into this new document, it'll be a lot easier to make adjustments going forward. 
So if we find pieces that aren't working very well, um, and I, we will look at to the committee as well as people who are using the system to help us with refinements going forward. So we, let's make this big leap. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, let's be okay with that. And then let's refine it as we go forward and have do some check-in with the, the committee and with the community as we put this process in place to make sure it's doing for us and performing the way we need it to. So well, what we have right now isn't working. So let's bring it forward and um, then align it as we're um, getting it focused, I think is what the intention going forward. We're not gonna get it perfect the first time, but I think it's gonna be a lot better than what we've got. Um, let's, any other, anything else on section three? So am I keeping the 75% until we see how this all unfolds? Yep. That's what we're, okay, cool, that's what I heard, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hussman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We don't have a police department staffer with us, unfortunately, but um, it, it occurs to me reading through 3.2, we don't necessarily have great um, measurement criteria or suggestions related to the walk and roll initiatives. Is that something that we need to address? So I don't get run down on the sidewalk by bicycles anymore? That would be fantastic. So, yeah, bicycles should not be on sidewalks, for one. But um, <clears throat> two, two, though. Sorry. Well, no, but it, it's a valid like, I question. I almost right? got run is down it, two, two weeks ago, so I'm still a little bit irritated. It, it's a valid question, though, and that is it the job of the Kaiser Police Department to monitor sidewalk activity, or should they strictly be uh, limited to monitoring car traffic activity through speed tables or something? I, I think this is beyond the scope of this. Um, and, and police, we have a police liaison at Traffic Safety Bike Ped, correct? We do. So in the scope, of, in the course of the conversation um, about the issue being brought forward by people, you'll get input from Public Works and from Kaiser Police. So if it could be documented at that point, that will be the staff input that I think would help inform going forward. Would that work? At least for right now. At, at least for right now, that's an amicable solution. Because it says right here, once the study complete, Kaiser Police will provide feedback at the next traffic safety bike pad. Yeah. Which absolutely their feedback is welcome and it's been super valuable, so 100%, yeah. Okay. Anything else on section three? Tammy, anything else to highlight for us? I don't think so. Okay. Council, anything else to highlight? Oh, on 3.3, uh, step three, um, not everything needs a speed study. And to Mr. Griffin's point, yes, the vast majority of the complaints we hear are about the rate of speed, but it may not be all inclusive, so I'd like to include if necessary. Because um, not everything needs a traffic speed study. Well, okay, that brings me, though, to the, the scoring process revolves all around speed, volume, traffic, et cetera. So speed is a large component. It's the largest point right. system part of that. Um, so let me just take a step back from what I'm hearing here. Okay. Most of the, what we're trying to address here is, is safety and it's usually revolving because of speed. Not, not, cause, cause if we well, look car at car speed specifically. Yeah. Car speeds, correct. Because if there is something um, okay. if there, if, if the concern is bikes on the sidewalk, that doesn't fit this document. That is a concern that comes to our committee. Yeah. Um, I think that's what Mayor Clark was getting at, is that just comes to the committee directly and we, we address it outside of this process. And so um, that's why speed is, is so okay. much in here is because that's part of the scoring system. And, and you are well within your right to rebuke me if I am attempting to stretch the, the pr this document beyond where we could have it right now, but 100%, we, sh we could kind of call it a spade a spade that um, a lot of what we've got is related to car speed right now. We just have to be upfront about that. Fair enough, okay. And so in, in section 3.3, that is a um, snippet of the scoring system in the back. Mm -hmm. and, they, and I brought up last time, they don't match, so I'm looking for city staff to help us know what numbers are actually supposed to be in here. So at some point, I'll need clarification on that. Okay, okay. fair enough. Anything else on three? 
uh, section four. I had um, just a thought on section four, the way it's, it's uh, phrased about the funding and maybe a little bit less specificity because the projects would likely come from the CIP, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily say from the current budget year. It really depends on available funds. And so this would, I believe, would have to be at that point referred to public work staff a recommendation for funding. I, I don't think we can get that specific in this document about where funding would come from because that's a staff, that's a staff function. I'm looking to Mr. Brown and Mr. Wood. Madam Mayor, can you tell me what page and paragraph you're on? I'm on page uh, 35 and 36 of the packet is uh, section 4.1 of uh, funding. So it's a uh, 4.0 with CIP implementation slash funding and section 4.1 is on funding options for um, neighborhood traffic management projects. And it has a great deal of talking about options and methodologies by which different projects can be funded. But I think a lot of that is going to be um, a recommendation and availability of funding um, through our street fund. Would that be a fair estimate? So I think a lot of this detail having to do with the city funds probably needs to be simplified that it's going to be recommendation of staff. Example would be the, uh, the speed beacons um, over on Alder. Those only happened because there was a uh, cost savings from another project that freed up funds. So Public Works said, hey, we were able to save some funds. We can do it this year. If it hadn't, that hadn't been the case, they would have had to make recommendation for next year. But that's a staff purview over the allocation of street fund dollars to make recommendation, as I understand it. Does that make sense? So was there a way to, um, and I'm going to look to staff perhaps to simplify the language in this section to make it um, clearer about what recommendations can be made regarding um, funding and the CIP, the Capital Improvement Program? So, um, Madam Mayor, are you, are you talking about after the bulleted list, which are different options that were, have been included in the past, uh, it would be funded, it says, uh, would be advanced to the city for full funding and implementation. So the bullets of the um, the bullets are you know all partially true. Uh, are there more? Less but you're talking about the last part there, where it says, or any new newer thing since this was last published. So I'm looking at the uh, paragraph one of uh, 4.1 funding funds for NTM projects would most likely mm -hmm. come from approved capital improvement program for the current budget year, current year budget. Okay. That right there, yeah. Yeah, right there. Got it. And I think we need to defer to staff to determine availability of funds in the CIP. I can just like remove most of this whole section if you prefer to have it just say funding is more than likely coming from the approved the capital improvement program and is at the discretion of city staff. Right. And just remove everything else because it makes it extra wordy. Right, and I don't have an objection to mentioning a local improvement district because, and I would take out the not recommended due to administrative costs because there are projects for which that is really appropriate. So um, that was not the bulleted. We actually have done LIDs. Uh, it's been very rare, but it actually has been done and turned out beautifully. Hornet? Yeah, Hornet Court. Yeah, that was fabulous. Stand by. Um, so if we maybe could group these by type, you know, ones that are city funded, privately funded, um, you know, alternate funds, and maybe give an example. But not, the, not that this is comprehensive, but it's illustrative. Yes, I like that solution. Give some examples, but it's not limited to yeah. or restricted by those mm -hmm. types. They include, but not limited to, and just some, some illustrative pieces. Councilor Husband. 
Thank, Thank you, you for your that. patience. I, I appreciate it. I, actually, a question for you, just just because I don't have as much experience in this sphere. Have we had a lot of public-private partnerships related to uh, road building and other kind of traffic management initiatives, as you can recall, um, where we've had significant private money? Because I absolutely agree that that should be a part of it, like the local improvement districts. I'm just curious as to what the history is. For the local streets, now this with the the larger CIP, the ones that are publicly funded, those are public. But I'm looking to what uh, Mr. Griffin was talking about was the Hornet Court project, which was a partnership with the residents there. And they actually, we formed a local improvement district to allow the residents on that local street to do the, um, the sidewalk improvements. And then they have the opportunity to then leverage the cost um, savings for concrete to pay for their driveways to be done at the same time. So it was very much a, um, a partnership and it, the project turned out fabulously. And if there was an obstacle and a challenge on engineering, design and so forth, I think he hit it all on that one. I remember it was quite complex. So, but it's very, it's very doable, but it, it took a great deal of staff time, but it really turned out great. Uh, but as far as um, private private public partnership PPP, I'm not aware of any specifically, especially on roads. That's all, except for McNary. Uh, that's a PUD, a, a public. No, they're an HOA, definitely. But yeah. well, that's a PUD, also. So they own their streets. I don't think we'll do that again. But yeah, and even LIDs are, it's, it's the public's money, mm -hmm. property owner's money. Right. It's a partnership. So it's an example. Yeah. If there are any philanthropically minded Kaiserites who are interested in funding road projects, though, <laughs> we'd certainly help them out. Yeah. Yes, please. So clarify exactly what we want written here. So <laughs> I, th I think that um, if you would work with Mr. Brown, um, because uh, I, I kind of gave an outline of um, this will be make these illustrative of the types of funding um, and then make it clear that our recommendations for projects through the um, street fund or capital improvement program would be uh, by recommendation of staff. So I wouldn't say current year because we don't know. So um, I don't want to wordsmith this one right now because we'll be here another hour, but um, if I could leave it to uh, Mr. Brown to work with you on narrowing that down. Good plan. Okay. We'll talk. Okay, anything else on 4.1? Okay. And then on the process, when it says construction will be completed by public works or by contract, I don't think we even need to say that because that will, that would have to be, the project would be constructed. Do we even need to say that it would be, who would, who would do the construction? They would have to be, if it's on a public facility, it's going to have to be either public works or someone contracted by public works, right? So. Does that need to be said? I think, she, um, Madam Mayor, I think it's just talking about the process there. Uh, well, get gotcha, the funding, gotcha. and then prepare a schedule, and then construction. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> All right. That I can you. remove the extra language and just leave it as stated here. As construction will be completed. Okay, that might simplify it. Okay. Uh, Madam, Council, Madam Mayor, Councilor Hussman. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Tammy. I guess the. We've danced around the question of how much inside baseball is too much inside baseball as far as getting <laughs> one of the one of these projects up and done. I think um, there there definitely needs to be a lot of light shed into um, how how a project is packaged and then how residents may know about it or how that information may come out. Um, once the shovel hits the dirt. 
maybe that's a little, maybe that's the point just where residents kind of step back and say, okay, construction's happening, so we don't need to get too into the details. We can watch the, the public interfacing, or frankly, it's yeah. something that, you know, TSBP, we'd get updates on from Mike or from a public works representative as well. So we'd have that information out publicly anyway, and it'd be transparent. But definitely a question that we might as well make explicit because we don't want to be too implicit on everything that we say here. Well, I think it's really important to celebrate um, completion successes. So um, one of the things with the spreadsheet I love is that it's going to track a project. You know, if it's going to go to construction, then you can didn't. And I think that's part of that communication to the community, you know, how this is working. So reporting out completely. Um, 4.2 monitoring. Any comments or questions on that one? And thank you for the simplification. Okay. And I think that's the end of it. Yeah, the rest of the appendices um, mm -hmm. with the technical stuff that I just need some feedback on. Um, not only the scoring system, but the toolbox itself for missing a road type there. So I need some guidance on what would qualify for the, um, let's see, we have neighborhood collector, local. We don't have anything for a local street. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for that. And does the city agree with all of these as options in the toolbox? Or do we want to dial that back a little bit to what we would be actually agree to? Because some of these seemed very much as, as stuff that's off the table to begin with. So <coughs> I just start with the um, appendix A. I did have one comment on the, um, the sur neighbor survey. And the um, it says, uh, by signing the survey below, you are indicating you believe that the problem identified above is unacceptable and that you support implementing dot, dot, dot. Can we take out unacceptable and say a concern? It's a little bit less, I don't know, <laughs> intense. Emotional. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so that's, what, that's what that one jumped out at me. Anything else on the, um, the affected neighbor survey form? And this will be available online. And again, if, uh, if there's a way to make this available for people to go online and sign it. I was just going to ask that. How, that's up to the city to decide how they want to approach this. Is it something someone can just log into? But I don't know how that would work rather than have a paper copy. Because if we do, then where does that go? Thank you. So that was a question. I'm sorry. Um, I got distracted. Sorry. It's his fault. Um, it was not a question to be answered at this moment. But Okay. But that's something for, um, for to explore with the staff. What are the opportunities for online um, engagement? Uh, Madam Mayor, you had uh, Councilor Starr, or President Starr. Oh, Council President Starr and then Councilor Reed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Brown. One thing that I would like to understand or perhaps make a suggestion is the use of QR codes into Google Docs or Google Forms um, as a way to most everyone, not everyone, but most everyone has a smartphone now. Many people use that as their computer or their, you know, um, in place of a laptop or a tablet. Um, and so are adept at QR codes. And so when we have these, I'd also like to challenge this instead of petitioning, um, that this also be considered in lieu of if we don't have a neighborhood association, um, but creating um, QR codes that can then feed into some type of a um, Google Sheet or some type of a, a document or takes them to a form that they can fill out that then populates a Google Sheet. I think that that um, helps address, um, could potentially help address the need to knock and ask people to sign on, um, sign a petition, if you will. Um, also, it allows um, translation abilities um, right, QR code, what, you know, you can give them options of what language they want it to be in. 
so whether it's in a, a, an, a, a system in, in lieu of having a neighborhood association or this neighborhood survey, I would really encourage the city to look at the, um, what that capability or capacity would look like to make it easy for our community to bring these issues forward. It's a great idea. Uh, Councilor Kohler, you've uh, found something at the bottom of the um, of the survey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It says a minimum of 75% of the affected property owner signatures must be obtained. That gets back to the owner versus resident uh, question that we had earlier. So for the record, I did not even look at this to plan to update it because I knew we'd be discussing it and hopefully moving away from it is in its current form. So I'm looking again to staff for what they want this to be um, and then have the appropriate language around it. But I agree with what you said there. That does not belong. Right. So it would have to be changed to president. So. Mr. I agree. Yeah. Uh, you may have an out of state landlord. Mm -hmm. um, you may have a local landlord but the people that are impacted are the people that are in the mm -hmm. home. Yep, I like it. Thank you for pointing that out. Follow up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think that's, I think that's a great idea as long as it's not going to require a financial um, uh, input by the, by the owner. Anytime we're going to ask the owner to, to pay something, we, they need to be a part of that. And yeah, that's once we get into a project development such as, you know, a sidewalk or something, um, again, going back to the speed table, we had to engage with the property owner on the south side of Cummings Elementary to complete that project. So construction changes it then to this public works does what they do so well. And that's the connection with the uh, anybody around a construction project. So, and that that's all part of the implementation. Okay. Anything else on this? Just, oh, Councillor Reed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, um, I, I appreciate uh, Council President Starr's uh, suggestion. I appreciate um, the uh, suggested solution to that, and. Um, I think, though, it would be really important to be able to um, verify those signatures because um, with shared documents and so forth, it it could, again, get to the point where we are not doing that uh, with integrity, I guess. So just some sort of um, checks and balances with that to verify those signatures as we do with other things. Um, and then my other comment, and this is just a really minor thing, but do we really need daytime and evening telephone uh, <laughs> on that uh, survey? It seems mm. to me that just phone number would suffice, but. Pretty much, yeah. There, there was a throwback, um, daytime and evening, you know, rotary. I still have one of those <laughs> in a closet somewhere. Uh, thank you for pointing that one out. Um, and then add email. Well, yes. Yeah, because it says mailing address. But that's for the petitioner. Oh, the petitioner, yeah. Yeah, all that information is, the, uh, we don't ask for an email. That's true. Of the, but maybe we should. So um, the, the petitioner, will have, they'll have to have an email some, somewhere, if at all possible. Almost everybody has one. I'm going to say almost, because there are people in our community who don't. So the well, there is that too. Quick yeah. question, because I don't know. know technology that well. Do QR mm -hmm. codes, when you scan them, does um, to to what Councilor Reed just said about um, however you worded about tracking valid signatures? If I use my phone and you use your phone, does the end result recognize the different um, users because of the different phone numbers, as you would an IP address for a computer? So then that would help with that solution as well. Okay, good. <laughs> um, 
We, well, I'm just thinking of, you know, around town right now, it's vote for the best in the Willamette Valley. How yes. do those track that you, the they same person doesn't? Right, so whatever that well, technology is. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna stop right there. So we'll, we'll leave that to the development of this. And again, mm -hmm. um, we'll try things and we can continue to refine. Um, eventually what happens is this petition, this uh, concern about X comes to traffic safety bike pad and then there is a conversation. And then that uh, proceeds to what is next. And I think that's part, the main goal is to create a rational framework by which people can uh, find out how to engage, can then have accountability for the problems that they bring, tracking, they can say, well, I'm concerned about this, thank you for bringing that, you know, we talked about this last year and here's the findings. So that's the other thing too, is that someone may not have not have lived here or they weren't engaged in that, in, in whatever conversation has previously happened or something has changed, but it opens up that opportunity for ongoing improvement and communication using the Traffic Safety Bike Ped Committee in a way that I think it was always intended to and just hadn't figured out until now. So, anything to wrap up here? Um, Council President Starr. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So I know you took the um, first of 20 drafts to the um, Diversity Engagement Committee. Um, when this is ready to like prime, almost ready for prime time, if you will. Um, will you be taking it back and sharing the changes that you made with their feedback and getting their input about um, community engagement and equity and all of those I'm types of questions? Because that, that was gonna be one of my questions is <coughs> once we dial this in, who does need to do a final review and then um, to the scoring system, Nowhere in here does it even discuss equity, and is that something the city does want to look at as a scoring um, component? And that's something that should be answered sooner than later so we know how to adapt this accordingly. Um, so I'm hoping that ties into that as well. And then, yes, I agree at the end, we should distribute it one more time for any refinements, if, if everybody agrees with that, or we just move forward. Um, and next year when we uh, look at it again, we, um, we can track the changes during that time period and just do it then. It's not my decision to make again, it's up to the people who own the document. I like the idea of sending it um, with this refinement, um, at least making it available to the Community Diversity Engagement Committee for their read, um, anything additional, and then um, bring it forward for us for adoption. Again, the sooner we put this into action, the sooner we get to keep trying it out see what works and what refinements we can make and get input on that. Um, as far as equity criteria, I think there was a few things that were discussed at Community Diversity Engagement, but I think ODOT has a better scoring tool, equity scoring tool or lens. And I know we worked with on one at uh, MWACT, the Mid Willamette Area Commission on Transportation. We actually included um, a draft equity definition, and that's available on our website. And if you can't find it, I, I've got it. So I would encourage that maybe we can embed that into the document um, in some portion, and I'll have to think about exactly where or are uh, open to recommendations on where that can go. So we, um, MWACT, we developed an equity lens and a safety lens. And I think that those are really important tools for remembering this is what we're about, is creating an equitable and safe system for all users. Okay, all right. Anything else to wrap up this one? Councilor Husband. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Three quick comments. One being uh, for appendices C and D, the traffic control measures. More, more information is better than. You and I are pretty steeped in this. We know a fair, 
we know a fair bit about a lot of what these are and what they look like and where they are around town, for example. I, I would imagine that not a lot of people petitioning <laughs> for these changes are. So it's, it's a good opportunity for choosing your own adventure and continuing education, as much information as they want to uh, as, as they want to learn about with regard to what can be done for traffic safety, then we can equip them. And if they don't, then we can still work with them on the process. So I think that uh, that that all's well that ends well, <laughs> effectively, as long as petitioners are satisfied. Uh, number two, quick comment for Mr. Brown. I'd love for this to, to be a City of Kaiser homepage button, personally. I, I think that this is one of those... Uh, opportunities that we we have to just feature something when this process does go fully online that uh, having something directly on the home page to link to everything would be most helpful so the residents feel like they can see this front and center at the very least for initial rollout purposes and then third thing um, I just wanted to thank Madam Chair of the Transportation Safety Bike Peg Committee for her uh, diligent efforts in this. It's been a pleasure to serve with you on the committee as liaison. And I did want to shout out the other members of the TSBP committee as well. Uh, there is a lot of discussion, both in volume and intensity, and uh, it it truly has, I think, made some things better. <laughs> and, and some of that actually may be reflected in this document, but overall, uh, the. <laughs> I do think the committee is living up to its billing and its merit for what it can provide to the city, and I wanted to make their contributions known. It's been wonderful to work with everyone. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work and the entire committee. Look forward to the final draft coming forward for adoption. Um, what I'd like to do is take a five-minute break, and then we will go into our second topic of the night. It allows us to kind of shift gears and then talk about procurement. So we are gonna be in recess for five minutes. I'm, I just refilled, but thank you. All right, the City Council back in session. Part two of our work session for Monday, April 29th, 2024. We will now go to our second topic, which is the Public Contracting Ordinance Amendments. Another ordinance that is being brought forward from pretty much the last century. So, Thank you, Mr. Lindsay, for going through this and see if we can get um, get updated. Certainly, um, and thank you for the opportunity. I, uh, as I noted in my um, in my staff report, this ordinance that we've been uh, living with started in 2005, um, right close in time, like the next month after the Oregon Public Contracting Code uh, was overhauled and in 2003 and became operative in March of 2005 and ours it allows in that code for cities uh, localities to uh, either create their own rules or follow the model rules and so Kaiser right away within a month went with its own rules even though they're somewhat similar or were at the time to a lot of the model rules had a few uh, exceptions baked in that I think are helpful and um, my, one of my suggestions is to not throw those necessarily out the door. Um, and I'll explain what those are. But then uh, Kaiser did one little amendment in August of 2008 um, around public improvement contracts and just uh, the amounts uh, on those uh, from 50,000 to 100,000. But otherwise, it's stayed the same since 2005. Well, in that time, uh, the state code has changed a little bit. It's allowed for a few more exceptions to the code itself. Um, there's, I think, 34 categories of exceptions in in the um, regular code, and then uh, to to what even applies to the code. And then, um, of course, the expenditure levels that trigger various processes um, have really gone up, mostly due to just inflation. So, if in 2005, the main categories were between, um, you know, anything before 5,000 got a certain type of treatment, anything between 5,000 and 50,000 got a certain type of process, and then anything over 50,000 got a certain type of process. We went ahead and put those numbers in our code as well, um, not instead of referencing just the statute. And so we've, we've stayed at that area 
whereas the state has subsequently raised their amounts. Now their amounts are before 25,000, you can use any process between 25,000 and 250,000, you use the informal solicitation, which is trying to get three written quotes, and then above 250 for most goods and services you're purchasing, that's when you have to go out for either RFP or do a formal solicitation. Um, and so where, where we're stuck right now under our current code is anything over 50,000, we're going to that RFP formal solicitation, which takes up more time. Um, you know, you there's advertising, advertising costs, but then there's also in a formalized process, then you have to get a little committee together and you have to look at what your scoring is gonna be and then you have to score them and then you um, pick the one that you wanna go with. And so, or in a closed bidding situation, you have to make sure they're responsive and then give it to the lowest bidder. But here, what we're trying to do is just match basically what the statewide numbers are, just to put us kind of back on track with what the state and any public procurement is really about. We're gonna take the public's money and we're gonna spend it and we need to do it fairly and try to get the best price because we hold uh, public monies in, in the public trust. And so we, we can't just go out and give it to our best friends. We can't just go out and give it to the first person uh, that we find, you're supposed to go through certain processes. And so this is sort of the balancing act of, you know, you don't of course go out, it would be inefficient if you went out and had to find 10 people every time before you make a purchase. So the the state rules and our rules are, are an attempt for us to use kind of best practices. Um, and uh, so I'm comfortable trying to put forth in front of you that the, the state is calling best practices now at before 25,000, between 25,000 and 250, and then over that for, for most things. I will say this, public improvement contracts have not changed. They're still at 100,000. Um, and that's just, I, I think part of that might be the lobby that is the folks who apply for public contracting um, or improvements like roads and um, buildings and things like that. So, uh, and, and so that area still remains, has to have a full process over 100,000 and that, stays the same in our code. Um, my quick roadmap for us uh, is on page 50. And the reason we created this um, is just so that you would know if you wanted to go through, instead of doing a side-by-side -side with the two ordinances because the redlining became too onerous, what I ended up doing is really purging um, because there's definitions for, and very similar definitions to all of the definitions we had, which were like about eight pages of them. Um, those are in the public contracting section of the state law. And I would think that if we're dealing with people who, they deal with all sorts of jurisdictions, right? So it's nice that somebody wouldn't necessarily have to look up, oh, is their definition of something particular different than the state definition? So I would suggest we use the same definitions for these things because they're pretty standard, like what's goods, what's services? Um, so so I would su just suggest that we continue to, to use kind of the model language for that. Um, and so I purged a lot of that. What I didn't do, uh, like number one on my list on page 50 comes out of section four. And basically we had started to list out the classes of types of contracts that the contracting code didn't apply to. And some of them don't apply to us, frankly, either. <laughs> you know, it's like any, um, I'll give you a good example, like insurance and, and service contracts with, if you're the Oregon Health Authority and you're dealing with those. Well, we're not the Oregon Health Authority, so we don't, we don't necessarily wanna put that in our code and create the 34 categories. But, but I did want to say and recognize, since you are, as a locality, you're allowed to make your own public contracting rules, that we at least will adhere to those because say something does come up, like we were going to contract with OHSU, might randomly do that at some point, I don't know why feasibly, but if you did, you dealing with them, you wouldn't have to go find two other university hospitals, you could just go with them. Or, um, you know, the Oregon State Bar is one of them, the federal government is one of them, and sometimes we do contract with the federal government. Um, I'm sure it's probably pretty rare, but 
we, we end up getting grants, and grants don't actually fall under the contracting uh, rules either, but, um, or other contracting agencies, so if we're going in between contracting agencies, uh, that's other localities, that sort of thing. So instead of putting that list out, I just thought, why not put that whole uh, statute in, which is the 279A025 sub 2, so we don't have to list out 34 things, um, some of them that are irrelevant to us, but we just will follow whatever they end up putting in there, we will also recognize as, as exempt from the public contracting. So um, just to kind of take a little step back also, with public procurement, there are certain orders of operation that we need to do in doing public procurement that private contracting does not. Correct. So uh, can you kind of run down that um, order of operation for folks who aren't necessarily familiar with that? Um, like the um, going to the state, um, oh, what am I looking for? The, the state procurement, the qualified, um, uh, the QFRs. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll remember what that acronym is in a minute. Um, but kind of that, those requirements that we have as a public agency that private may not have. Well, and so, interestingly, whenever we try to use and make a, a public contract, right, there's, there's certain categories of contract, um, and the, the first uh, kind of series of contracts might be what we generally think of as goods and services, um, and those have particularized rules. There's a category that is personal services, which is, you know, more professional type services, and those have their own little categories. Then there's some carve outs that are, um, that I think had a strong lobby at one point uh, a few years back, and those are the, the engineers and the photogrammatists and the land surveyors and, um, and appraisers, and they have their own subsect of rules. So first of all, you figure out what category you're in. Are you in a public improvement contract, right? Where are you gonna fix a road uh, or build a building using public monies. Um, then after you do that, then you have to ask which amount. Because if it's under a certain amount, like right now, if you're here, if it's under $5,000 and you wanted to buy a good, right, and you're, you're in this uh, locality, well, uh, let's pick a good that's $3,000, right? Um, a, a used car. Say we want to buy a used car for $3,000. Um, if it were under 5000 you would go, okay, it's a good, and it's under the $5,000, then I can actually use any process I want because it's under 5000 So cool, because there wasn't gonna be another $3,000 car necessarily down the road, so I could, I could use that. Now, let's take a step back. Same idea, but now it's a $13,000 car. Currently, we would have to shop around for uh, two other cars beyond that, the way our code is written, because we're oh, over 5,000, we have to go get th three attempts at formal quotes. So th this starts to become a little bit more relevant. We ha we're, we're confined by these rules because we are, it's any, any private agency wouldn't have to necessarily do that. They might, because it might be, you know, behoove them to kind of shop around. But if there's one $13,000 car that we would want to buy, right now we'd have to go shop around for a couple other cars before we made that purchase. Um, now, if personal services is another way in which we spend money at the, at the public, and right now, if it were somebody said, I want to redo your website, right, and it was $6,000, we would have to go and look for two other folks. Um, if they said, we wanna do that and then we wanna be in a contract to work with you for another few years, and uh, currently our contract limits to two-year contracts. So if the, what we're trying to do is expand that to three years here. But these are all types of parameters that aren't built on uh, private industry as much. I know it doesn't get into all the different types of law because there's a lot of um, state laws and federal laws that kind of play into the types of contracts. So there's certain types of contracts too that if we 
go out for, say, janitorial services, then they have to be on a certain list in order for you to even work with them. Um, so I know you were sort of intimating at stuff like that too, is if it's, a, depending on the type of purchase, sometimes there are even additional rules and it if, in a few additional um, procedures that you have to go through and lists that you have to find people on. But but the long and the short for, for us here is that we wanna define the category and then we wanna define how much money you can spend um, before you have to go to a ratcheted up process. Currently, if, if you say you wanna go buy an SUV, um, this is maybe an odd example because really what happens is we get onto a cooperative agreement in this case, which has already gone through a process, so we can piggyback on that. But say we just wanted to go buy an SUV tomorrow for our um, public works folks. We would have to go get, if we didn't piggyback on a cooperative agreement, we would have to go get, say if it was gonna be over 50,000, we'd actually have to go out for a, f a formal solicitation, um, which would be pretty onerous. Um, whereas if we raise those categories up, we could at least only get three quotes before we make that purchase. Or use the um, cooperative agreement, <clears throat> and these are the state uh, purchasing agreements, correct? Yeah. That, uh, we can use, so th those are lists that have already been created, they've solicited for vendors, and then we can go onto that website as through um, what's called Oregon Buys. Mm -hmm. uh, Council President Starr had a question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Lindsay, so a couple of questions. If somebody, how does somebody get on the approved cooperative list? So like I think back to when we had, um, we were buying that new truck for public works, right? Um, how would like a local, if they didn't, maybe they missed um, the opportunity or the window to get in on that original, however that process works at the state to become part of that buying agreement yeah. or that, right, become a, an approved vendor. How would an entity go about getting approved to be a an approved vendor as part of that uh, that buying agreement? That's question number one. <laughs> Do you, do you know the answer? Because uh, to be honest, I will acquiesce uh, or, or uh, um, bow to the, uh, the mayor's understanding of that. I've never actually put any or, or tried to have somebody apply and go on one of those. So I don't, I can't speak to the exact process. I can. Okay. So recently the state of Oregon switched over to a program called Oregon Buys mm -hmm. and vendors that would like to be part of the Oregon Buys uh, cooperative uh, purchasing, they can go online and they can then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, apply to be a uh, pre-approved vendor. Um, there are parameters that go with that and then they are part of that purchasing agreement. So um, it was a big change from, I think it was ORCAP or something like that, the Oregon uh, Cooperative Purchasing Program and ORPIN, which was a real pain in the neck, um, which was a, um, a procurement network for state agencies. So it's Oregon buys, and uh, they go on there, and then they can walk through the process of becoming a, a, a pre-approved vendor uh, for providing goods and services. And I know certain types of industries, I brought up the janitorial one, I, you would have to prove that you hire a certain percentage of um, disabled folks. Yeah in order to get on those lists. So, so I know there's certain parameters, but I've just never walked a company through those. And a follow-up to that is also COVID, the, the um, <clears throat> certification office for uh, uh, businesses that are uh, women-owned, uh, disabled veteran, or veteran-owned, disabled veteran, um, minority-owned. Yeah. So they go through that process, it's through um, Business Oregon. They, uh, they maintain the list for the state of Oregon. So if you're doing contracting and you are a prime or a sub and you have to demonstrate a particular level of, um, of um, contracting for disadvantaged businesses, you go to look at those lists and any business that would like to be included in COVID, they uh, can go online, work with um, Business Oregon to become certified. Follow up? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So when I look at this, um, table or the grid. you know, one of the things, and this is speaking for myself, 
is ensuring kind of the responsibility that that we're we are ensuring that taxpayer dollars are used responsibly. So I'm just curious what the checks and balances are. If we were to, I'm looking at kind of in the middle on page 50 where you have personal services, con the current ordinance has personal services contracts more than 50,000 um, and you're proposing on the, the proposed ordinance to go more than 250,000. So that's a huge jump of $200,000 between where we are now and, and where you're proposing to be. So what is the checks and balances built into this system under the proposed ordinance that would ensure that if, um, you know, Susan resident asks me, how do you know that my tax dollars are being used efficiently and effectively if you're now not seeing things under $250,000. Here's what I'll say about this is, um, and thank you for asking this because it's it actually does lead into one of the decision points that I'll ask you about. Um, you currently give uh, your city manager who is your contracting agent, uh, also called contracting manager under this, um, the authority right now to spend up to 25000 before he has to come in front of you. For his, I'm sorry? Up to, he has the ability to spend up to 25000 before he has to come in front of you. Correct. Um, we're asking in this to raise that up to $100,000. Um, and so, but you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can choose how many of these you would want to see. Under the middle that you pointed out, the... the um, the personal services contracts up to 250. Those are the process. So, so between if if you do what I'm suggesting here, if if you're going to hire somebody to do work for you, and it's going to be say a consultant to redo your uh, your UGB, right? And and part of that'll be like a consultant to also do your TSP, and it could be 300,000 that person's still going to go through the full process of uh, formal solicitation, right? Because it's over 250. If you could get it under 250, if you could get it to like 200, then you would just have to interview three people and get formal quotes from them. So it isn't like we're not doing stuff, it's just we're not doing as much, um, if that makes sense. But to answer your point, again, for, like I did at the beginning, you being able to be a check and balance on that is you can you can decide what level you want to see a contract before it get, goes out. So so we'd have to come get permission from you if my suggestion on this, I, I was trying to look at different cities and see where they're at, and there were some at 75 and some clear up at 250, and so I was trying to kind of ballpark, but it's still up to you because it's a decision point today, or not today, but whenever we vote on it, um, is how often do you want to see contracts? Because the other, the other check and balance is the budget committee. Mm -hmm. So th this don't, these don't get sent, right, or, or category, only, we can only spend money in the categories that you guys give us uh, the ability to do it, or we have to come back for a supplemental budget. So there's, there's a couple of different checks and balances from your position to, to look at this, but what this allows us to do as a uh, staff is everyday stuff or stuff that's in the plans, the CIPs, or stuff that's in the works and in the budget. We don't have to come in front of you every single time if you do raise that amount. And if we move the categories over, what we don't have to do is advertise, have a little committee looking at, you know, scoring and then, and then uh, g giving people it unless it's over. 250,000. So what it does, it just simplifies our ability to find people faster, I guess. Sometimes speed isn't the best thing ever, but you know, it gives us the, the informal process in the middle, which is getting three quotes instead of going through the full formal solicitation process. Does that make sense? Follow up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So who decides who those three quotes are from? Um, it, it sort of depends, right? I mean, so if 
oftentimes, oftentimes the directors of the departments will kind of know the players, you know, so they, they might reach out. So in, in the informal process, quite honestly, it, it usually is the director of- So it's who you know. Sort of, but, but I think also what ends up happening is I think people ask around. It's kind of how a lot of people, you know, look for price. Sometimes you look online, depending on what it is. Sometimes you, you know what I mean, look in the area. Sometimes you ask um, or know of folks who are kind of the, the competitors or people in the past that you've used that you liked working with, all those sorts of things. Or your trade, um, your trade uh, associations. Yeah, yeah, yeah are the big ones for a lot of that contracting. Or COVID, you can go to the um, Oregon, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Mm -hmm. so, no. But COVID has a really good list as well for different um, types of procurement. And I, I think it depends too, because I, you know, I might have a certain level of expertise only about certain very limited, yeah. you know, lane. And so right. somebody might even come to me and say, do you know a good lawyer, right? Whereas I would have to go around asking, <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Reed had a question. Um, I, this may be totally out of left field, um, but I'm just wondering if uh, the auditing committee is relevant to this in terms of, is, is that the purview of the auditing, auditing committee? Mr. Wood. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, no, this would be more of a policy decision beyond the, the auditing group. Um, while this is one of the areas that our external auditors would take a look at uh, with regards to compliance with our purchasing policy, because that is a requirement for the, the state, um, the decision on the, the purchasing levels really is, is a city council level, uh, level decision. Thank you. So, you know, with the categories we're looking at, um, when you're looking at procurement, you're looking at the small, intermediate, and large, and that's the level of um, detail or formality of the procurement process. And one of the benefits we have of being part of um, Oregon buys, being able to uh, take advantage of Oregon buys, is that any local company service can get onto Oregon buys and register there. So it's a really good clearinghouse for getting. Um, a broader reach for uh, businesses that would like to be part of that procurement process. And it's really opened it up. One of the old system was a lot more cumbersome for businesses to be able to engage. Oregon buys is a lot easier for businesses to engage and to be able to then uh, receive public uh, contracts. So that was one of the reasons they did that, aside from the fact that the old one was just a pain in the neck. Um, additional questions? Uh, Councillor Kohler, did you have a question? I did, thank okay, you, Now we'll go with Mr. Brown. <clears throat> so un under your proposed um, items here on 50, page 50, if if we were had determined we need two or three more police cars, as long as they didn't exceed $100,000, that we wouldn't see that anymore. Um, it would, so, it correct, if, if, you um, gave the the expenditure authority to Adam uh, Brown, the uh, city manager, uh, and it and one of the police cars ended up being under a hundred thousand. Then it w he could sign off on that. He would ha have automatic permission from you if it were in the budget. So if it were in the budget and then it came in under a hundred. That's what I think. Thank you. Whereas if it were two, you might because it too might come up um, over that amount nowadays. And you can't fragment? No. Okay. Well, not if you use the same cooperative agreement. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So fragment means to split something apart for the purpose of getting under a certain dollar amount in your uh, contracting and procurement. So that is something that is uh, can be challenged. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Brown. I was just going to uh, say we use a site called QuestCDN for um, construction jobs, 
Yeah, and that's where a lot of contractors know to go so they don't have to try to sweep every municipal website for procurement projects and then they deal with the plans and I, I, I think they might their money by selling the plans, copies. Uh, but it's, it's pretty effective and it's pretty uh, well used. Yeah, part of the idea behind Oregon Buys was to make it easier for uh, contractors rather than, um, like you said, having to go and search all the different websites for all the different municipalities and, and, uh, and counties. By having one registry there, um, they could put in the, uh, their codes for the kind of work that they do, and then those will pop up. So they put in a search or they can ask to be notified. So if County X puts something in and it includes the code for the work that that particular company does, they're going to get a ping. And then they can go ahead and bid if they so choose. They can At least they'll all know it's there rather than having to go on that website on a continual basis and search and hope. So it was a great, it was a great time saver for the contractors as well as for the uh, contracting agencies. So it was trying to, again, level that playing field and make it easier for uh, companies to be able to engage in uh, public contracting. So I just want to put that out there. Okay, do you I want to walk, I, it, walk I us through? I'll reiterate, um, what, it is whatever your comfort level is. I realize because we haven't changed this in a while, this is like one of those classic examples of the jump seems extreme um, and that's frankly why I leaned on what the state's doing because th at least that's a rationale I can get behind um, but you don't have to do that or you could stagger it you know what I mean you could you could say why don't we increase it a little bit for efficiency sake but then agree to revisit this two years from now or you know what I mean like what Whatever comfort level you guys are really at, I'm I'm just trying to do what it is that the the group would like. So um, the the chart that we were provided, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Lindsay, jumps us from 2005 to the um, small, intermediate, and large procurement levels that are currently being used by the state of Oregon. Correct. So all of those changes you're seeing are those jumps. And that's when you're dealing with something that's 20 years old and the level of a you know, couple of recessions and inflation and so forth, that's where you're going to see those big shifts. And I, w I should say that's the kind of the model amount. So a lot of the cities are moving to those if they haven't already. It's just be consistent across the different procurement types. Also, um, there's a lot of staff time that goes into formal RFP processes. It is very labor intensive. Um, questions from council? Okay, proceed. Council President Thank Starr. You. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, so I um, have lots of questions, but I also wanted this converse, I wanted to hear your um, kind of your presentation, if you will, before um, I spent too much time digging in. My initial knee-jerk reaction is not to go and put the city of Kaiser on the same purchasing level as the state of Oregon. That, in my mind, doesn't make sense to give a city of 40,000 the same freedoms or, so to speak, um, or purchasing abilities as an entire, like a budget as big, large as this state. I personally would like to see this state open for a while to have conversation for to allow um, conversation and input and communication from the residents on what they think should be appropriate purchasing levels um, and changes for this. I, I agree that there should be some updates. I'm just not ready to blanket adopt this, the model rules um, for the state of Oregon. I think there's a huge difference between this state and the city of Kaiser. Um, so before, w my preference would be before this is pushed forward um, to um, being part of a city council agenda, I'd like this to remain open and some of this to be out um, for the community and residents to be able to, to come 
um, comment on. Councilor Reed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I, if we did that, I think it would be really important to give some examples of how much things cost, because on the whole, um, people have no idea how much things cost. That The uh, right turn lane uh, on 14th Street, for example, $600,000 for that right-hand turn lane. And um, so just to, to be illustrative in the, the different categories and so forth, um, you know, the, the police car costing, you know, 100 grand or, or whatever, just, just so people know uh, how much things cost because it is different than in the private sector and we need to be, uh, if we're going to ask for their input, we need to be able to allow them to give that in a, an educated way. Councilor Kohler. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I appreciate all the work you've done on this because I'm, I'm sure this wasn't real easy. The second thing, um, Mr. Brown, uh, I'd like your opinion of how how these numbers feel to you. Is this something that would make you nervous having that type of authority, or would you feel comfortable with that? What What's your general feel about <coughs> these numbers? Madam Mayor and Council, um, thanks for the question. I think I kind of expected uh, incremental steps and for me, this maybe not to jump to the highest level, but for us to uh, try something in between first and then look at it again. Uh, just knowing that it hasn't been updated in uh, so long to be able to make that jump all at once is, is a big leap. So um, what's, uh, Mr. Lindsay put some uh, comparisons in there. And I think uh, you know, fifty to seventy-five thousand dollar would be a good incremental step, you know, and look at it if a year or two. Good, good, Councilor Husband. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Lindsay, thank you for putting this together. I really appreciate it. Turned it off. I'm sorry. No, it's on. Yeah, it's my red light's on. All right. <laughs> Couldn't hear you. <clears throat> I must not be as loud as usual. I apologize. <laughs> Mr. Lindsay, thank you for putting this together. I, I do appreciate the thorough nature of this. And um, I, I, find, I, I find the breakdown of the presentation informative. And frankly, this is something that I would feel comfortable moving forward based out of this work session into a general session of council. Uh, one point that I'd like to, that I'd be interested in based upon what's in the proposed ordinance would actually be upping the city manager's general authority to, uh, the figure I have in mind would be 150,000, but I think there's a clear hierarchy as far as what the, what the city manager is able to act upon versus departmental heads and executive leadership on down the pathway according to the city's bureaucratic structure. And I, I think that makes sense, one, but two, I think uh, giving the city manager a little bit of extra authority above and beyond the 100,000, which is a popular number based upon how the state's rules have <laughs> been outlined. They, they love the numeracy and they wanted to stick with it, but I'd be okay increasing the city manager's general authority because I do think that given how the city, given the power structure in the city of Kaiser and given how much the city of Kaiser's city manager is so integrally involved into operations, it makes sense, I think, to give that position an increase in authority relative to others, including the department heads, as you've outlined here. I. Um, I can see the overall downstream effect of this being, as Madam Mayor alluded to, an ultimate savings of time and consideration and work upon staff as we go forward. And I think that uh, this is being brought to us at an important moment where we do need to consider some of the administrative capacity that's on hand with the staff and with uh, some of the significant technological changes we're bringing about, the HR information system coming immediately to mind. So we have an opportunity to strike while the iron is hot with 
the proposal as seen before us. I think it's been carefully considered. I think that the uh, state of Oregon guidelines appear to be an effective baseline, especially given how inflation has increased everybody's cost. And I think that this proposal does reflect that careful consideration. Again, I do actually feel comfortable awarding more authority to the city manager because I think the city manager position within this city uh, should have that additional flexibility from a contracting standpoint. But uh, beyond that, I appreciate everybody's feedback and I'm glad we're having this discussion now. Thank you very much. Madam Mayor. Uh, I was gonna go to Mr. Brown because he had, did you have a comment or do you want me to go to Mr. Lindsay? Uh, I think Mr. Lindsay is gonna say what I was gonna do, but I, I did have something to say after that maybe. All right, Mr. Lindsay. We'll see, we'll see then. Um, I, I know a lot of cities, what they'll do too is even if there's an expenditure authority and it's, uh, you know, the, the budget really drives that, is that's staff reports and um, city manager reports are for this sort of thing too, where they would easily say, hey, by the way, we just purchased two police cars. You know what I mean? But but what it wouldn't do is necessarily require you to have to have a res an additional resolution come before you with a staff report and all of that. So um, it is, it, it's just an efficiency. Councillor Duran, you've been uh, quiet. Um, I was kind of thinking the opposite of what uh, what was previously addressed. I, I was thinking a little bit less than the hundred thousand. You know, come down from going that big jump is what my initial thought was. And, and um, you know, we've been working on what we've got. You know, even though things have increased in cost, and it and it has been working, and I can see streamlining by raising the values to some extent, but I wasn't thinking going all the way up to the state standards. So, um, you know, having worked in this, um, this area and following the process of the adoption of the, uh, the change in funding levels for the small, intermediate, and large procurements and understanding the level of effort that goes into those different uh, categories of procurement, I am very comfortable with these levels um, I also am sensitive to, um, you know, the concern about the large jump, and I'm very comfortable with going by increments. But at least I don't want to see another twenty thousand dollar contract on our agenda ever again. I think that's ridiculous. If we are nitpicking or uh, micromanaging to that level, um, I think that if we have given budgetary authority through the budget process to the city to procure X, and then we want to look at the contract for procuring a small X, I, I don't think that's a good use of our city staff time, and I don't think it's um, efficient use of our oversight. So I'm really comfortable with increasing our levels. Um, so I'd like to get a, a sense from the council, and I'm starting to get a sense of it because the the full jump is to the um, 25 and, you know, from the 5 to the 25 and the 150 to the 250 for delineating the three categories. So looking at the first one, going from the 5 to the 25 for the small procurement, is anybody uncomfortable with making that leap for the small procurement? Because I don't think, I'm not getting the sense that that's the discomfort zone. So I'm, I'm kind of getting a, a sense that that's, that's the place where we're pretty much okay. So we can have the conversation about the delineation for the large procurement. Mr. Brown. I'm uncomfortable with President it. Star. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what I was gonna say is it's, it's easy to focus on the spending limit for my approval, but one of the biggest changes we're, we're uh, making in this ordinance is in the process. Mm -hmm. And that is really where the time is going to save the bring it to the council was not as time consuming as as all the other stuff we go through. So um, that's there's a lot of process improvements and I'm grateful that, you know, a year ago the council said and they said, hey, this, you know, I had lots of conversations with all of you and said this stuff takes forever the way our policies are written and you said we'll change it then. So. Mm -hmm. 
definitely need an update. Uh, again, 20 years. So what I'm hearing um, from council is on the delineation for the between the intermediate and the large procurement, the uh, informal to the very formal RFP process request for proposal. Um, I think um, separate from the um, construction, and that still has the hundred thousand, correct? So let's split that into two different conversations. Um, on the construction, that's that's remaining the same, correct? So there's really no decision point there unless we unless we want to do something more than the state. But what I'm hearing from you is the conversation about um, going from the 150 to the 250 on the intermediate to large, where it's informal to the formal process. So right now it's, it's at 150,000 is the delineation between an intermediate, which is the informal three uh, solicitations, and formal RFP process. Is that correct? Uh, for, and for goods and services, it's 150 right now. Right. For the personal services, it's at 50. And so the, I, there's a, and the, it's weird because so goods and services are more like when you buy the, you know, computer for the car and then they also install it. <laughs> if if that's a good example, whereas personnel services are more like hiring a professional that does a very particularized mm -hmm. thing, um, and those are there's a code for everything. But um, the currently our code treats personal services as fifty thousand at the top of the intermediate, and then the goods and services at one hundred and fifty. So okay, so it's, there's a, there's like a whole dance in our own code that. Is, you just have to understand it, I guess. But <laughs> just so I could answer correctly, I, my suggestion would be to raise both those up to the the intermediate amount. But if if people were more comfortable with a lesser amount, um, that's also fine. Make him make him consistent. Uh, Council President Starr, you had a question or comment? Yep. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I don't know. I, I would imagine people. There are some people that are like me and are very visual um, and like to see things um, kind of lined out. It, I would be curious on the different decision points, how many of each type we've had over the last year that have either a, like I would like to know how many we've had to put out to RFP and what they were. And I know that somebody might say, well, you can go back and look at that yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I probably could. But I'm also asking if staff can like, just kind of give us an idea of what we're looking at in a general year of what is in and what levels have had to go through the RFP process. And that means like the posting, um, the publishing, right? Um, somebody said they had to be published somewhere. I think that's Department of Journal of Daily Journal of Commerce or something like that. But I think just seeing what it is, how much it was for over the last year and what that process is might help people understand literally what's the volume that we're talking about. Because having two things be time consuming is very different having two processes, right, that are time consuming is very different than having 15 things that are time consuming. So I think understanding the volume in which we're dealing with is really important because if it's two versus, it's, I, I just think that that would be a healthy piece of information for us to have and frankly for our community and our residents to see when we're talking about a big change like this. Um, is that data readily available? That's what I thought. Okay. So to kind of get an idea of how many of these processes we've had to do, uh, Mr. Wood. Uh, just anecdotally, I'm looking through our, our check register for the last year. And I mean, between the 25 and the 100,000, there was about 75 checks that we wrote. The majority of those are either employee benefits or they are uh, construction. So really, for that that range, the thing that we're really talking about are, are vehicles. 
Um, you're, do you want to continue to see police vehicle purchases or, or not? I mean, that's, that's the majority. The other things that I'm seeing are playground equipment, which I, I think fall under the construction piece. Okay. So it's very, very, very small numbers of things that we have to go through the full process with. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Husman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> I echo Council President Starr and appreciate her point that it is nice to know what those procurement numbers are, in part because I get the sense that we haven't necessarily had that snapshot in time before. And so understanding exactly how many big checks we've written and where is just a generally good position for transparency and something that we can take back to anybody in the, in the city of Kaiser who's asking, frankly. So I, I think there's a good governance case to just make sure that we have that top of mind. It occurs to me further that looking at when we last updated this document, and we, we're talking nearly 20 years of change, especially related to information technology and some of, some of the software engineering and development and services that the city is currently relying on to function. And these are getting increasingly complex. They're not as easy to implement. They require some hand-holding uh, <laughs> contracted services or even third-party services to administer. And I think the future of city procurement is such that some of what we're considering as staple services, I go back to the HR information system again, but I think we've seen others, uh, are just getting more and more and more complex and the complexity is costing us money the further we drag it on in some ways. Now, even, and, and that's not necessarily even at the top end, that's some of the intermediate functions as it relates to information technology, as it relates to technological sophistication. So it, it almost becomes then a question of resiliency, which I think we do want to bake into our procurement strategy. Are we being able to meet the moment from a timeliness standpoint, knowing that the world got a lot more complicated than it was when the document was last updated when the ordinance was pushed through council last? Thank you. So I think um, if I can summarize a little bit, a lot of the conversation that I'm hearing is going to be about uh, kind of going back to, do we want to look at aligning the, the two different categories, the personal services and goods and services, to be one number instead of two different categories for the procurement types? And then how far do we want to go in terms of setting the difference between an intermediate, i.e. informal, versus a, a formal procurement? The current level being for goods and services being 150, and the state has gone to 250 uh, for any one of a number of really good reasons, but whether or not we're comfortable with that. So is that pretty much the decision point? Yeah. Looking at Mr. Lindsay. Correct. So for um, let's break that into two. Is there a desire to keep the two categories separate as far as personal services versus um, goods and services or have them be the same, uh, bring them up to the same level, whatever we decide that's going to be. Councilor Husman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I favor combining the two under the same dollar amount because I don't necessarily see the benefit in uh, keeping them as separate dollar amounts. Thank you. Council President Starr. I don't have enough information because again, I'd like to see what they were and how many we've had. If we're talking about updating an ordinance for the purchase of police cars, I, I think that begs a different conversation. Um, so I would like to see what it is under each of the different categories and how many we've had over the last year. If there's been one in each category, Again, I think that that brings up a different conversation that we need to have rather than just, we need, I just need more information before I'm willing to move forward. I don't feel like I have enough data. 
So from my point of view, it's about aligning our procurement policies so that we have updated them. So I feel that we need to set the parameters on how we want to go forward with purchasing. So it's for me, it's less about the number of incidents, but uh, the streamlining and the clarity of our process so that both our staff and our suppliers and our contractors know what they're dealing with. They don't have to navigate a variety. Um, also, we're making a very big leap in our procurement process so that, again, staff time is going to be spent actually count conducting those procurements using a standardized policy. Um, the one we have right now is really convoluted. This will really streamline it and bring it up to today's dollars. That's why I'm a lot more comfortable with going forward. Councillor Kohler, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm not very comfortable with, with the city of Kaiser having the same limits as the state of Oregon. The state of Oregon uh, often spends money like a drunken sailor, and I don't think we need to adapt that policy for Kaiser. Um, did I say that out loud? No, no, I said I think I said that earlier yeah, as well. Yeah. And um, the other part is I, I feel pretty comfortable with what uh, City Manager Brown said about making that, uh, doing that in increments, mm -hmm. uh, and that way we feel more comfortable with that, and he would, would feel, I think, more comfortable. As long as we're all comfortable with that, I think that would be a good policy to uh, put forward. Thank you. Council President Starr. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Again, before we decide on what those thresholds are, I would like to see the data of how many contracts and purchases we have had for the different amounts. Because if it's one or if it's 15, it's a very different conversation. So before I agree on any of the thresholds, I'd like to see the data. Thank you. Councilor Reed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I am also, um, uh, of, of your uh, opinion about it's it's about the policy and we've heard many times that process matters and that this is part of building that process and uh, giving the overall um, policy of it and um, so I am comfortable with this and in terms of the the state limits I'm also comfortable with that because it costs the state the same things the scope of projects may be different but the general Costs are, are more or less the same. And so uh, so I'm comfortable with what we have here. It's a, it's a good solid guideline based on logic, based on data. And um, I think that this, I'm comfortable moving forward with this. One thing I'd like to um, also remind us that um, as far as what will be procured, that does go through um, our budgeting authority when we establish a budget. Um, we say that the city of Kaiser is going to purchase X, Y, or Z during the com coming year, either in terms of goods or services. Um, we have already said that we have set a certain budget amount, and then it is the, uh, the job of our staff to make those procurements based on what we have budgeted. So we don't get in the weeds of budgeting, saying we, we want $200 of this and $300 of that. We simply say, procure materials to maintain the parks. And then it's up to the parks division to decide, is that going to be fertilizer, mower blades, and so forth. That's not what we do, but we have allocated funds for goods and services within parks, for example. And I think that it's important for us to keep that in mind as we're looking at these procurement levels, uh, especially raising the uh, small procurement up to the 25. It's just a way, way simpler for everybody rather than have to go to the solicitations for a $20,000 purchase, for example. Um, so what I need to hear from council is, you know, there's comfort with we're going to the full 250 for the uh, threshold between an intermediate and large procurement. There's discomfort with that. There's a comfort with going partway between the 150 to the 250 rather than making it a full leap. And there's some discomfort with going, making any change at all without additional information. 
So I need to get a sense from council what you would like to see staff to bring back to us for deliberation. And um, so we're kind of a, we're running the whole gamut here. Councillor Kohler. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Is it possible, Mr. Wood, to send to each of us just the general numbers and then we would have those numbers to, to look at before uh, we actually make any final decisions? I mean, we, we go ahead and put it on the agenda and look at it, uh, but that would give us some opportunity to uh, not, not take three, four months to make this decision. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, Council. Yeah, we could put something together. Um, I do have a big project that's kind of taking a little bit of my time for the next week, but shortly thereafter, I could probably get to it. I, I know, Imagine right? that. You're not done yet? Yeah. So, no, this will not be, like, uh, due next week, but I think to Councillor Kohler's point, I think that would uh, be helpful to look at what this looks like on the... Um, and I'm going to throw some numbers out here. Tell me if you like it or not. Um, our current level is 150 to look at the 200 and 250, what that would look like moving up in those increments. And what would that impact in terms of uh, the types of purchases, um, the thresholds, and uh, the involvement or the, um, the requirements for those, those three levels, um, what that would do to our purchasing uh, and procurement process. Um, does anybody object to, um, and I, 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 again, I heard, I hear Council President Starr on the personnel, uh, personal services versus goods and services. Again, let's look at that then step by step, 50, 100, and then aligning it with uh, the goods and services. Does that make sense? So we have um, some good data to show what that will look like in terms of our procurement uh, process and the level of work that goes into that. Um, I saw, was it Councillor Hussman, Councillor Reed, and then staff comments. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And you, you asked what it was that we wanted staff to bring back, and I wanted to put a bow on it. What I would love to see staff bring back is the ordinance as currently constructed with the additional $50,000 of authority to city manager for a total of $150,000. Because again, I do believe that the uh, position and the nature of the city manager's work relative to city procurement warrants that. Okay, thank you. Councilor Reed. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I was just, um, did a quick Google search. Um, Hundred and fifty thousand dollars in two hundred or in two thousand four is worth two hundred and about forty thousand dollars today. So really, we're by moving from one hundred and fifty thousand up to two hundred and fifty thousand, considering inflation, that's hardly moving at all. Thank you. So with the data that uh, we've asked for uh, from the city staff. Uh, after budget, and this is going to go on pause until we get, <laughs> you're welcome, Mr. Wood, um, until after the budget process is completed and then bring it back to city council for uh, consideration in after budget. I won't even try to give a month to uh, give staff some time. Is that acceptable to council? I'm getting head nods. Mr. Brown. Yeah, and I, I, I'd like to bring you the data back, not only that, but maybe some visuals, some flow charts. Um, I always love a good flow chart and that can show you the, the change in levels and um, not just what we're talking about approval levels, but also of what type of solicitation we're looking at. And anyway, we'll give you a lot more to work with than, than you have tonight. Sounds good. All right. Anything else that we need for tonight? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lindsay, Mr. Brown, Mr. Wood, for all the work on this. Looking forward to, again, another giant leap for Kaiser. All right, the time is 8.20. We are adjourned.